district in the districts of council members Cabrera, Ayala, Gibson, Perkins, Reynoso, Torres, King, Cohen, and Joni. Collectively, the projects uh, receive Article 11 uh, exemptions to support either the new construction or preservation of approximately uh, 2,059 units of affordable housing throughout Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, and Queens. All of the council members in the relevant districts are supportive of these actions, and the details on each project are available on the City Council's website. The Council will vote on the site selection of four new schools, a 650-seat intermediate school in Councilmember Manchaca's district, a 458-seat primary school in Councilmember Salamanca's district, a 458 primary school in Councilmember Gibson's district, and a 592-seat intermediate school in Councilmember Brandon's district. The Council will vote on the following land use actions. Uh, Manhattanville Walkway, the Council will vote to approve the acquisition and disposition of property in Councilmember Levine's district to develop to facilitate the development of an opened landscaped walkway. Uh, Brownsville North Oceanville NCP Cluster and Councilmember Alika Amprey Samuels District will facilitate the transformation of two city owned vacant lots into 32 units of affordable housing. And the JFK North site in Councilmember Donovan Richards' district, uh, we're bringing back uh, Bartlett Dairy to Queens and approximately 200 jobs. We'll be voting on the following affordable housing preservation projects Lenox Avenue Cluster in Councilmember Perkins' district. East Harlem El Barrio CLT and Councilmember Ayala in Perkins's district and Cloth Cluster in Councilmember Levine, Perkins and Rodriguez's district. Moving on, the council will vote on the following pieces of legislation. First, Councilmember Justin Brandon has put forward introduction 826A, which would expand reporting requirements to provide the public with more information related to the use of life-saving technologies in serious fires. First, the bill expands existing reporting requirements related to smoke alarms or detectors to now include reporting following all fires that cause a civilian fatality or a life-threatening injury. Additionally, the bill requires new reporting on the presence and activation of automatic sprinkler systems at the location of each serious fire incident where the department deploys more than three fire engines. And uh, I want to congratulate Councilmember Brandon. We're joined by Councilmembers Kalos, Powers, and Rodriguez. Next, introduction 732B uh, from Councilmember Ben Kalos will establish what is often referred to as a full public match, wherein all participating candidates could reach their expenditure limit using only matchable contributions and public funds. This full public match would be available to participating candidates who select option A for the 2021 elections. And starting in 2022, it would be available to all participating candidates. Additionally, the bill amends the act to incorporate relevant portions of ballot question one as approved by voters in 2018 by moving them out of the charter and into the administrative code. It would also adjust dates, deadlines, and requirements within the act to reflect the earlier June primary date established by state law earlier this year. And finally, it removes language that is previously sunset or otherwise has been moot. Uh, this would be a big step forward in campaign finance, making public office much more accessible for many, many potential candidates out there. And I want to invite Councilmember Kalos up to speak on this bill and congratulate him. Thank you. I want to wake up in a city with a government that actually works for New Yorkers. Affordable housing, a world-class education for our children, and a transit system that actually gets you where you need to go. When I got elected, I introduced legislation to increase the match to $250 per donor and allow candidates to go from matching a little more than half the small dollars to matching every single small dollar. The problem was that while the public matching system worked for the city council, helping newcomers who reflect their communities and the diversity of our great city get elected at a borough-wide and citywide level, the big money gap was far too large to fill with small dollars a staggering $2.6 million big money gap existed for the mayor's office and still does today under option B. Last term, even with 32 sponsors and as chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, I couldn't get this bill done. We couldn't make it a law. Last year, Mayor Bill de Blasio went around the city council and took the issue of campaign finance reform straight to the people who it turned out cared a great deal about this issue. 
On November 8th, 2018, 1.1 million votes were cast in favor of campaign finance reform proposed by ballot question one, a staggering 80% of the total. To be clear, people were voting to get more money out of politics. This was not a vote to have less money in politics. It was to get big money out and replace it with public dollars. That is the clear intent of what people were voting for. Following this victory, I authored Local Law 1 of 2019 to apply these reforms to the special election for public advocate. And in that law, the Campaign Finance Board asked it to be applied retroactively, and we did it. Now, the new system works and has already flipped how campaigns are financed upside down. For the first time, a candidate won citywide office with a pledge not to take real estate money. <laughs> Thank you to Jamani Williams. And what we saw is that big money no longer made up the supermajority of campaign cash, and it was replaced by small dollars. However, more than one third of the money still came from big money. And it's a result of the big money gap that still remains. That is why we need a full match. I want to thank Corey Johnson for his commitment to everyday New Yorkers in supporting and passing this legislation. You, pro you, you were a sponsor last term. You promised when you were in the speaker's race at a citizens union debate to support this legislation. You've been true to your word, and there are very few politicians that are true to their word. Usually measure politicians by the times they break their word. So I thank you for being a man of your word. 2021 is the worst nightmare for me and every renter in this city. 38 council members, five borough presidents, the control and the mayor are all termed out of office. I shudder to think of what special interests and big money will do to try to elect a government that works for them instead of for the communities they represent. When I ran in 2013, I didn't take money from real estate. I was mocked and ridiculed to my face, and I don't know what people said behind my back. Everyone said that real estate runs this town. I was offered more money from real estate than I could ever imagine. I was told to take it if I wanted a future in politics. I chose not to work for real estate, instead to work for my community. I didn't let a broken system corrupt me, and today we have an opportunity to change the system. I want to wake up in a city where elected officials don't work for big money. I want to wake up in a city where elected officials work for our residents. A special thank you to my two-term co-prime sponsors, Fernando Cabrera and Brad Lander, and newly elected reformer Keith Powers, as well as the staff, Rob Newman, Brad Reed, Daniel Collins, Elizabeth Cronk, Emily Forgione, and Sebastian Bacci and Central Staff for their work on this. Sorry I went so long. It's been a 10-year fight. Uh, this is big, and I really thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> uh, introduction 799, sponsored by our public advocate, Jumani Williams, will protect individuals from retaliation when making requests for reasonable accommodations. Currently, the, city humans right, the city's human rights law does not specify that requests for reasonable accommodations are protected activities for the purposes of a retaliation claim. As such, courts have denied claims of retaliation by employees who have faced negative employment actions as a result of a request for a reasonable accommodation. Introduction 789 clarifies that retaliation is prohibited where an individual requests a reasonable accommodations, and I want to invite uh, the public advocate to come up and speak on his bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, yes, as you mentioned, this is a retaliation bill. I was actually very surprised to learn that it was legal to discriminate against someone for asking for a reasonable uh, discrimination. Uh, for example, it will be pro this bill will prohibit any retaliatory action by an employer if an employee requested a reasonable accommodation uh, on the basis of religious observance, disability, pregnancy, childbirth, medical condition, or their status as a victim of domestic violence, a sex offense, or stalking, among other reasons. There was previously no mechanism that protected employees from any retaliatory action by their employer in asking for a legally required reasonable accommodation. This 
is one of those bills where I found it was crazy it didn't exist, as I mentioned. Uh, I thought it would just be a loophole bill, but actually it is not. There is case law where people were fired for asking for reasonable accommodation. In 2006, a case, uh, an employee requested additional leave time to accommodate her disability and alleged that her employer terminated her in retaliation. Under the court's analysis, protected activity for the purpose of retaliation claim only includes protesting a practice forbidden by the human rights law, McKenzie versus Meridio Capital Group. Another case in 2015, an employee requested accommodations after experiencing seizures for five months after beginning work and was terminated shortly thereafter in Hernandez versus Wild Cornell Medical College. Rather than, her, rather than hear her argument, over whether the termination was related to her request, the court determined that the employee could not state a retaliation claim because the act of requesting accommodation is not recognized as a protect protected activity. Uh, this bill will allow employees to make claims to the Human Rights Co uh, Commission on Human Rights when employees were retaliated for asking such accommodations. When employees have temporarily injured themselves or pregnant or all the other ones uh, that I mentioned, employees should not be afraid for asking for reasonable accommodations to be more efficient workers. All employees have the right to work free of discrimination, harassment, and retaliation, but we had to have worked um, uh, with this council and other bills that are similar, like the boss bill, the DV protections bill, the veterans bill. Uh, all employees have the right to work with dignity, and it's bills like these that I advocate for to create a better work environment so that New Yorkers can become more valued and productive employees of their great city. I want to thank the Chair of Civil Rights, uh, Council Member Eugene, and the Speaker for his support. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, next, we have a series of bills related to incarcerated individuals in New York City, including two from the chair of our Criminal Justice Committee, Council Member Keith Powers. The first, Introduction 1236A, is intended to improve access to care. Introduction 1236A will require the Department of Correction to publish a report on data pertaining to production for scheduled medical appointments. It will also require the department to retain all records having to do with last minute sick calls uh, appointments and would ensure that incarcerated individuals have access to a sick call five days per week, excluding holidays. The second bill from Council Member Powers is Introduction 1370A, which will streamline the intake process for grievances and improve access for incarcerated individuals. It would ensure that all complaints made through and one are addressed through a formal grievance process. It would also require a th all third-party complaints to be addressed through this process. It would ensure that the department informs every incarcerated individual in writing about the grievance process and about protections against retaliation. It will require DOC to include all grievance forms, including appeals forms, on its website. I want to congratulate Keith and invite him up to speak. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Speaker. I'm proud that we'll be passing two bills today. They're my fifth and hopefully will be my fifth and sixth law here in the Council that are about folks in the criminal justice system here in New York City. As mentioned, the first bill will streamline and improve how incarcerated individuals access health care in jails as a direct result of work that the Board of Corrections has done and a result of our hearing that we had here not so long ago. Nearly one-third of all scheduled medical services for incarcerated individuals did not result in a patient being seen by a physician or health care provider in September 2018. We don't get to choose when we're sick, and we uh, certainly, if you need to see a medical appointment, you deserve that. And our bill, my bill, and the bill we're passing today, will ensure that those in need will, to make their appointments and are cared for, and um, information will be better shared about correctional health services and what's available to people who are incarcerated. I just want to say that we were, I was personally disappointed and dismayed about realizing how many people who either want sick call or medical appointments aren't seen. And I really want to thank the staff and, and, and my team for working really, really hard on this bill to get it right, to negotiate all the fine details of it. We worked on this for a very long time, and I'm really glad we're passing it today. And the second bill is intro 1370, which addresses how complaints, grievances are processed in our city jails. Um, filing a 311 complaint can um, sometimes be complicated for these folks. They don't know exactly where that's ending up. And um, with, uh, when it's made within a jail facility, it can sometimes go unanswered. Or even worse, it gets answered, but then nothing happens of it. Um, ever since they made the 311 calls freely available to incarcerated individuals in 2015, the amount of complaints has increased significantly, from about 20,000 calls in 2016 to 30,000 calls in 2017. And in last year, in 2018, there were 27,000 complaints about jail conditions that were made via 311. 
Um, I'm really happy for this bill as well because it's going to give somebody who makes a call a better assurance that that is going to end up into the process that is formally established to get a grievance um, uh, resolved and to be able to better address complaints that are happening in our city jails. I think it's a big step to help those who want, who want to come forward and make it uh, make grievance and it will ensure that when they do that, when they make that call, that there's a process that they will enter into for that. So again, thank you to my team, thank you to the speaker and all the folks of the committee for voting for these bills to morning um, and again these were this was a really a lot of hard work from the committee staff I want to thank them for and Lana and everybody else for their work thanks, thanks. Congratulations to Keith. Uh, next uh, Councilmember Diana Ayala, uh, Councilmember Diana Ayala uh, is passing introduction 1340a which will require the grievance process at the Department of Corrections to be more efficient and creating a central system where it can track all complaints and appeals and it will give regular access to the Board of Correction to that system. It will also ensure greater access to the grievance process by requiring at least one grievance box to be placed in each facility and requiring caseload guidelines for grievance coordinators. The law will also require DOC to install electronic complaint kiosks by 2026. Councilman Briala can't join us today, but I congratulate her. Uh, next is uh, also related to the grievance process. It's introduction 1334A by Councilmember Alik Ampri Samuel, and it will require the Board of Correction to issue a report at least every three years on issues related to the department's grievance process. Grievance process. This report will incorporate direct feedback from incarcerated individuals and proposed recommendations for relevant improvements. The bill requires the report to include a section of recommendations on how to improve the grievance process for vulnerable populations, included in car including incarcerated individuals who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, or gender nonconforming. And I want to thank Councilmember Ampri Samuel and congratulate her on this bill. Finally, we have two bills related to art on city-owned property. One comes from Councilmember Inez Barron, which is Introduction 1114A, and it will create a task force to study and issue recommendations regarding monuments, statues, public art, and historical markers on city-owned property. Those works that have been subject to sustained negative attention or may be viewed as inconsistent with the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion will be prioritized for review. The task force implements, this task force will implement recommendations uh, of the January 2018 report on the Mayoral Advisory Commission on City Art, Monuments, and uh, Markers. And I want to congratulate Councilmember Barron and invite her up to speak on this important bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm so pleased to be able to introduce this bill and encourage all of my colleagues to support it with their vote. In the Bible, there's reference to the Ebenezer, and the Ebenezer was a place where a monument and a marker was placed so that those coming behind in future years would stop and ask, what is the meaning of this place? Why are these stones here? Every time we erect markers or monuments, we call attention to the fact that something significant occurred or a person who made a, make a major contribution was associated with this site or a monument was installed for that purpose. You may recall there was a big push to have the J, Dr. J. Marion Sims statue removed and we were successful. We have some other battles that we're fighting in that regard as well. But we believe that there are other statues and monuments around this city that also need to be addressed to look at whether or not they should remain or what should occur in their place. So this commission will take place, this task force will take place rather, and will study that and will issue recommendations. And I'm excited, excited about the possibility that we will be able to address those statues that we feel are inappropriate and should not be commemorated and should not be elevated so that our children coming behind us and others who come to say, what is the meaning of this marker would think that there's anything significant that we want to elevate in our history. Thank you so much. I want to thank all the staff that worked on that, as well as my staff. Thank you. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank, thank you. And lastly, introduction 1439A, sponsored by Councilmember Rafael Salamanca, will establish that the Public Design Commission uh, has to set a goal that at least 50% of non-fictional persons represented in new works of art 
be women. It will also require the Public Design Commission to advise and provide strategies to city agencies on how to increase diversity of representation in city artwork. And I want to congratulate Councilmember Salamanca on this bill as well. That is it for today's agenda. I look forward to proceeding with today's votes. Does anyone have any on-topic questions? On topic. Yeah, Willie, sorry. Yes. Uh, when you read the bill, it says specifically that it repealed the uh, ballot measure that was approved by a large margin of the voters. So the voters approved uh, uh, the campaign finance system that the council is now going to see. No, that's not what. That's not what we're doing. I, I, well, that's, why is it appropriate for you guys to repeal what the voters did I can, and then change the situation? That's not, I'll let Ben start first, but that's not accurate. So the word repeal. You have to, I'm happy to explain it to you, but it's not accurate. Go ahead, Ben, and then I'm happy to jump in. When we did the charter revision with the mayor, I was a supporter of the Yes, Yes, Yes campaign. One of the criticisms from some of the newspapers in our city was that through the Mayor's Charter Revision Commission, we were passing legislation, we were, we were putting legislation before the voters that could be done by the City Council without a vote of the people. Exactly. And uh, the place that things like campaign finance had historically lived were actually in the administrative code. So when we were doing the legis and so following the Charter Amendment, in the Charter, it said the limit was $2,000, uh, and there was a, a whole new system created in the Charter, which actually directly contradicted what was in the administrative code. Exactly. And so when we go in and make amendments, sometimes you'll find in a lot of our bills, cleanups. We might change a, a Arabic numeral to an alphabetical numeral. Uh, this is very similar. We are, when we repeal from the Charter, we were moving the text from the Charter into the administrative code and cleaning up the administrative code so that it is completely accurate and all in one place. This happens all the time where when there are certain, when the, when the city council sometimes passes new legislation that could conflict with the city charter, we have to clean it up and make sure that it's consistent. So this is the first time ever since the Campaign Finance Act was created that something was not done by local legislation and it was done by a charter amendment. So every other time that the Campaign Finance Act had ever been amended, improved, changed, it was always done through local legislation. So as Ben just said, there was a conflict where the Charter Revision Commission passed something which I supported but then it conflicted with what was already in the administrative code. So what we did was we moved that language into the administrative code to be consistent. That's what we did. There was no repealing what the voters passed. We didn't change anything the voters passed. We incorporated what they put, what they voted on in the charter revision into the administrative code. How do I say this in a succinct way? Um, we changed the law and passed legislation that Councilmember Kahlo sponsored for the public advocate special election, which is consistent with what we're doing today. And Scott Stringer didn't say a peep, didn't say a word, nothing. No one did. So. We are literally doing something which is entirely consistent with what we did three months ago. And now all of a sudden, we are being criticized for it. I think he is confused about the legislation because it is just not accurate. Comparing it to term limits 
is wildly inaccurate. Uh, for the record, he was a huge proponent of term limits. He testified at the city council in favor of extending term limits. So I don't understand the comparison that he is making, given he testified here at the city council in favor of extending term limits. On the issue of does it benefit anyone, Scott Stringer or anyone else can continue to operate under the same rules they have an operating under. They can operate under the six to one match at the $5,100 limit without returning any money whatsoever. We're not forcing them. We're not saying they have to opt into the new system. The, the Charter Vision Commission ballot question gave two options, option A and option B. We're saying pick an option. You can't operate under one option for part of the cycle for the first 18 months and then midstream switch to the second option. What we're saying is you have to be consistent throughout the entire election cycle. We did make, I think, a significant uh, 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 accommodation in this for people like Scott Stringer and other folks that are rolling over significant sums of money that they war chested in previous election cycles. So Scott Stringer, I think, rolled over over a million dollars from the previous election cycle that he didn't spend into this election cycle. We are not touching that money. He gets to keep that money at the higher limits, no refunds. Those are the rules in the prior election cycle. This wasn't envisioned then, so he gets to keep that money. We're saying for the current election cycle that you're in, just like we did for public advocate when no one criticized it, you need to pick a set of rules. Option A or option B, if you want to stay with option six to one match, you can. No one's telling you you can't. You want to raise the higher limits? You can. No one's telling you you can't. But you have to pick one set of rules. And this was recommended by the Campaign Finance Board who sent us a letter recommending this. Now, this Campaign Finance Board, as you and all, is very strict in how they go about determining these things. They sent us a letter recommending this. Reinvent Albany, which is a good government group that criticizes the City Council all the time on a variety of issues, sent a letter to us saying, recommending this on retroactivity. So the Campaign Finance Board and good government groups supported it in the public advocates race and now support the bill today on the retroactivity being consistent. That is what's going on. Uh, Anna? Why would you guys make that amendment then within the last week? I mean, there are multiple versions of the bill, and the part that Stringer took issue with was added in just last week. So what was the point of that? If, why, if you guys were always going to do that, if you guys did that in the public advocates race, why not have that in version A? I'm not, when was the hearing on the bill? Uh, I, let, let me just know, when was the hearing? Do you know when the hearing was? It doesn't even matter. April. Well, no, it does. It, it, April. It, it, you're asking, because you're saying you're public advocate. It does matter, because I, 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 like two months ago. Give me three seconds. It's, it's okay. I got it. It, it. it was in April or May that we had the hearing. At the hearing, uh, the city campaign finance board asked for the, Step up to sorry. Me. We had the hearing, I believe, in April or May. Let me just pull the, I think it's in the release that all of you should have by now. Uh, April. On April 15th, we had the hearing. On April 15th, Campaign Finance Board asked for the retroactivity. I asked for the retroactivity. Most of the hearing was devoted to talking about retroactivity and the fact that it was the right thing to do. Uh, the City Council. Why would you put that in the first bill? That's what, that part I'm asking. Sure. Well, because bills change all the time. Every, every bill. You guys were always going to follow the way you did with the public advocate. But the bill, this bill existed before the public advocates so, oh, race sorry. and before the charter amendment. No, this bill has been around for a long time. Uh, Keith, so sorry. Intro 732, when it was reintroduced, was a mirror image of Intro 1130A. Uh, so we reintroduced it. It was one of the first bills that I reintroduced. That's why it has such a low bill number. Keith Powers is actually one of my uh, co-prime sponsors, along with Fernando Cabrera. Uh, we made changes. We did an A version uh, that hewed very close to the uh, Charter Revision Commission. Uh, I don't know why we didn't include the retroactivity to begin with. I think it was just because it was something that got negotiated into the local law one, because 732 had, again, been there for so long. And ultimately, uh, it's, it's something I've been pushing for since the very beginning. And what I'll just be very honest about is when the people spoke on November 6th, I listened, and I wasn't trying to get